So, Brian, it's such a pleasure to have you with us at Penn State, and, and thank you That's for coming to and spent a couple of days with us. Um, we do this program called Coil Perspectives, where we ask um, thought leaders to come in and talk about a, a few things, and we have this three-question structure we'd like to, to present. Okay. The first one is um, asking you what your view or perspective might be on higher education. Where are we going? And we frame it in a relatively short amount of time, like three to five years rather than, you know, 25 years. So what do you think we might see in, in, a, uh, in, a, in a relatively short time frame? We might see a few things in that time frame. One is the, I think we will start to look back on the previous 10 or 20 years as a creative renaissance. We will look back at digital storytelling, at gaming, at social media, and we'll think, wow, we just witnessed a huge boom of creativity and democratic creativity that anybody could make. And I think that impacts higher education because it impacts teachers as creators of content. It impacts students as possible makers of meaning. And I think we'll celebrate that. Um, I think another part of this is I have a scenario called the Healthcare Nation where I think 10 years out, um, I play with the idea that the majority of our GDP will be dedicated to healthcare. Mm. And if we're halfway along that route, uh, I think in education we'll see a greater preponderance of campus presence for medical and health sciences mm. and life sciences. So we'll see more pre-med, more medical programs. Mm. And in K through 12, more preparation explicitly for that, call it the pre-pre-med mm. program. Uh, and that's partly due to demographics, and partly due to technological advancements, and partly due to uh, our good fortune to be able to live so long that we can have more bad things happen to us. Uh, I think the, the vision that worries me, that complements these, is that we could be living through a bubble where demand for higher education suddenly crashes, mm -hmm. where people either want less higher education or they want to spend less money for it. And one thing that may happen is we may see in three to five years fewer students in higher education and or students paying less money. And we know that the demand, there's no demand for higher tuition. Right? You know, mm -hmm. that people want tuition to go the other way. They're worried about that. And unless we can figure out a way to get state governments to spend a lot more money in higher education, this is going to be a huge financial crunch for higher education. Let me follow up on that, though. So, so if there's potentially a less of a draw to, say, higher education, where, where will those individual go, individuals go to become students? Is it a different format? Is it a different place that they'll get? Well, in some cases, they just won't go. Mm. I mean, it's possible that we have overbuilt higher education. Mm. I mean, we have, you know, the past generation, we've been fortunate to have huge amounts of new populations. Mm. I mean, now, I mean, it used to be the majority of college students were male. Now the majority are female. We have uh, minorities that are represented in ways that never have been historically. Lots of first-generation students. And it may be that uh, we have overstated the uh, allure of the college education. I mean, if you look at the Department of uh, Labor, it's leading jobs for the next 10 years. Most of them don't require any education beyond high school. Hospitality, uh, lots of service jobs, home health care aides, I mean, things that you can do maybe with an uh, associate's degree. Mm -hmm. um, so it's possible that they just won't take as many. But in others, they'll use alternatives online. Mm -hmm. uh, and that may be that they may take free classes, which is MOOCs, or they may take classes that cost less and overall can begin to bring the pressure to take tuition overall down a bit. Mm -hmm. So and it may be that they stay within higher education but downshift mm -hmm. within educational sectors. So going to a less expensive school. And if they're worried about uh, quality, they figure that they've won on price. And mm -hmm. that's a major feature for us today. Interesting. So um, it leads nicely into the second question about the, the, uh, the issues or strategies that higher education might engage in in order to kind of head off this. And, and I, I don't know if it's exactly a, a bad thing. It may be maybe a balancing thing yeah. where, um, where higher education is going to, to address the needs of a certain group, but perhaps other kinds of educational systems mm -hmm. emerge mm -hmm. to address other kinds of needs? It may be uh, that we have more learning on demand, which we effectively have now. And that's, in that case, it's mostly informal learning, mm -hmm. where people want to learn. Uh, you know, you go and see the movie Gravity, and you don't know a lot about 
uh, orbital mechanics. Mm -hmm. So you quickly go to the MIT site and pull down sites about how gravity and inertia work or the history of the space program. And you don't have to go take a, a paying class. Mm -hmm. You just grab that information. Um, it may be that what we have to do in higher ed is revamp how we present ourselves to the world. Mm. Uh, our lobbying for ourselves has not been good. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, uh, our reputation is lower than it ever has been, mm. and our lobbying state governments has clearly backfired mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. because the amount of funding we get from state governments is lower and lower. Mm -hmm. So it may be that what we need to do is just revamp how we present ourselves. A key way for doing that is to use uh, the web, use digital media. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have enough public intellectuals. We don't have enough Carl Sagan's out there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have Neil deGrasse Tyson, but he's not affiliated with, an, with a, a college or university. Yeah, right? yeah. He's with the Natural History Museum. So we, we need more people yeah. out there evangelizing. We need you mm. doing video. Wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, though, you're suggesting that maybe higher education hasn't kept up in the past, maybe we didn't have to do the marketing. The students just flocked to us. Now we're having changing demographics, and we're having competition from other kinds of educational. And yeah. higher ed has kind of sat back and no longer can afford to do that. Um, I think that's right. I think uh, a key aspect, I mentioned state governments, is we used to have massive pressure from the federal government, from state governments, from local governments, from public schools, K through 12, to get people into college. Mm -hmm. And we still have that pressure out mm -hmm. there. But now we have this unusual thing. There's a bipartisan mm -hmm. pressure to reform education, the whole thing, K through 12 as well as higher education. Mm -hmm. Didn't used to be. I mean, it used to be that we could kind of count on Democrats to defend oh, education. Yeah, sure. That's gone. I mean, you, you have the president who is, mm -hmm. who is fighting with higher education mm -hmm. openly. Mm -hmm. We have you know, his former, was Rahm Emanuel his chief of staff? Yeah. yeah she's, who yeah, was yeah. going to war with uh, you know, teachers unions mm -hmm. in Chicago. State by state, we have Democratic governors mm -hmm. You know, we're pressuring on education to be reformed and to be less expensive. I mean, that's, that's remarkable in my lifetime, and perhaps unprecedented in modern politics. And so all that pressure we used to have to get students in the front door mm -hmm. is now kind of easing up. And we have maybe the reverse. Maybe the pressure is still there, but along with it is uh, as a stick along with the carrot you know, to, yeah. to get us to change. And, and increasing calls for accountability, accountability uh, evidence of, of success. Evidence of learning, right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, and you see this with Common Core, for example, in K through 12. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're seeing you know, the, the Obama administration's desire to, it's not rank, it's to uh, assess um, higher education, individual campuses, mm -hmm. is in part based on lifetime earning. Yeah. You know, I go to this school, I get a degree in this. Sure. They should be able to figure out what's the, the college premium from that. Yeah, yeah. And, and most colleges don't want anything like this at all. Right. A lot of students, a lot of parents really do. Mm -hmm. and so that's an interesting... Uh, that's uh, a shift. It's a, it's a huge shift. Yeah. And we don't yeah. know, and we've got two years left of the Obama administration. We don't know what will happen in 2017. Mm -hmm. But you, know, you ask for three to five years out, yeah. I think that pressure is, uh, is pretty large. I, th I think we can make the case for ourselves on all kinds of levels, mm -hmm. including the economic level, sure. where we know that the college premium is what, uh, I'm sure you know this term, when you graduate, from college and you work until retirement, how much more you make as sure. opposed to if you didn't go to uh, higher education. And we know that that's big. You know, the premium is maybe $500,000 to a million. Mm -hmm. And if you spend, if you're $40,000 in debt to pay for that, what a deal. That's a terrific right. deal. Uh, but also we should, we have to figure out a way of making the case for the non-economic benefits mm -hmm. of going to college to learn who you are, yeah. uh, of learning to think, of learning to learn, and also that we are the best place for someone who doesn't want those, for someone who wants to go to school to get a degree in auto repair, or who wants to get a degree in nursing, or even in French literature, yeah. that we are the best place in the world for that. We've got to make a better case for Interesting. it. Interesting. So if I'm a, uh, a budding leader, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm going to be recognized in my institution to be asked to step into a leadership role. This, the context I'm now stepping into is kind of different than it was, say, 10 or 15 years ago. It really is. From your perspective, what, do I, what should I be paying attention to, or what strategies might I think of in order to be prepared for this new space? Um, think above all, from the start, that you are living in the age of the network and that that is a profoundly different way of, of leading than ever before. It means that you have to use social media. It means you have to use social media to get the word out 
of what you're doing. It's also a terrific way to learn about what you should be doing for mentors in, in leadership, for learning about your, if you're in a new institution or a new organization, mm -hmm. for following that and learning about it. I mean, social media is this unparalleled area of professional development and communication. And we've got to use that. I mean, any new leader has to take that up. And there's there yeah. many, many ways. Pick so I, I have to become a practitioner what you're saying, yes. of, of the domain, in yes. a sense, using the social media, immersing myself in, in order to make good judgments about how to apply that. Social media is essentially part of the leadership domain right now. Mm -hmm. And it, you can use whatever tool you like. It could be Pinterest, it could be Facebook, Google+, Plus, LinkedIn, mm -hmm. Twitter, whatever you like. Set up a blog. Uh, do you guys, you guys run a Twitter uh, version internally here? You run uh, Yammer, I think? Yammer, yeah. Use Yammer, whatever. But just that will enhance your ability to be a leader. Okay. The second thing is to network with people in order yeah. to become a better leader. To follow people who are in your position at mm -hmm. similar institutions around the world. Uh, just find out how they're doing, what they're running into, what skills they're learning, and then to find people who are ahead of you. Yeah. You know, someone who can be a virtual mentor, yeah. um, someone who may be an actual mentor who isn't physically mm -hmm. there. And then the other is to try to find any kind of organization that is studying what you're doing mm -hmm. and working with this. So it could be something like the American Association of Colleges and Universities. It could even be... Um, uh, a very narrow management organization, but follow what they've got. Because a lot of these intra-institutional organizations are just gold mines for resources and information. So I want to follow up. You used one word. You used it very quickly. But I, I'm, I'm a big believer of this. And you said worldwide. Mm -hmm. How important is it f today for today's leaders to understand a context outside of their state or their country or their continent? Uh, it's essential. I mean, we're, we're in a, it's a tricky thing, and, and this has never happened before, Larry, I don't think, in education in the U.S. We have to have one foot on campus and one foot somewhere on the globe. The world, yeah. And that's really difficult. You're speaking to two audiences. There's this awful Silicon Valley phrase called global, um, which mm -hmm. kind of works, but, mm -hmm. you know, but you need to be global and local at the same time. Yeah. So if you're at a school in Appalachia, if you're at a school in Los Angeles, you've got to be absolute careful attention mm -hmm. to what you're doing in that you have to pay, you know, that's what a leader has to do. But at the same time, their words, their policies, their actions, their projects will conceivably be scrutinized by someone in Moscow or in Cairo or in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And you have to bear that in mind. Yeah. Uh, and there's all kinds of potential for avoiding problems this way. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to think about sensitivity to issues, ethnic, religious, political, but you also have to think about benefits. I mean, it is possible that you will win fame for your unit, mm -hmm. that, you're, that you make a good feedback that will help you mm -hmm. out. But we have to assume that no campus is a silo, yeah. that no door is ever really closed. And sometimes it will be. I mean, you could tweet for a year and nobody listens, and that's sad. Right. But, right. but uh, or maybe they do. You'll get anything meaningful from it. Try something else besides Twitter. Or it may be that no one picks up on your policies. It's possible, mm -hmm. but they may. And we've got to act like it right now. But we have to become a uh, a global citizen, and that means being aware of the dynamics and yeah. the forces that are occurring Absolutely. in a larger space. We have to figure this out. I yeah. mean, so we think about. The, uh, we're talking earlier about the demographics of students. Mm -hmm. Well, we should think that in the U.S. we're going, we're, we're graying as a nation. Okay. Well, then we can take a look at, say, Scandinavia or Japan, mm -hmm. which have gone further down this road, and maybe we can learn from that. Mm -hmm. And maybe if we develop strategies, let's say we develop a, um, I'll just make this up, a, a senior citizens first year seminar. Um, think about those as potential markets or as or as allies. At the same time, we have to think about places in, say, most of Africa and the Middle East where the demographics are going the reverse. Mm -hmm. where there's a population boom of kids and minors. Yeah. All right, well, how can we address that? How can we connect with that? Yeah. Um, I mean, just at, at a basic level, it's, it's a much more complex situation. At an academic institution, you have the benefit of having in-house talent yeah. in departments like religious studies and political science and history, international relations, where you can ask for help. And I think that would be a welcome conversation and perhaps a really good way to build partnerships in-house. Very cool. Good. Well, Brian, I'll, I'll stop quizzing you there. I uh, oh, really, great. really these appreciate these insights. I appreciate your insights well, appreciate and, the questions. Uh, and the viewpoints. So thank you again so much for joining us. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much.